Hello everyone, I'm Kate Brown. Um, I um, I'm talking to you tonight and I'm sorry I disappeared then for what like nearly 15 minutes um, and thank you Tom for stepping in and doing your section first instead of second. Um, that's very helpful. Um, I will talk to you tonight about um, well, I won't talk to you about the Homes Energy Project launch because Tom's just done that. Uh, but this is our launch event and I'm going to talk to you about, oh, look, page down's not working. Oh, no. Oh, there we go. Uh, about buildings and climate change. So I've got about um, an hour presentation. If you have questions, it would be, um, I would prefer if you could keep them to the end, please, because I think if we start, if I start taking interruptions, I just never get to the end. Um, but please do make a note of your questions and let me know. And if I can't answer them straight away today in the Q&A at the end, then I will endeavour to respond to you separately. Um, so this is me. I'm talking about buildings and climate change. Let's see page. Ah, there's a page down. So I, um, I co-founded the group with Nicola um, two years ago. Um, she may have already said that. Um, I've got um, a master's in performance and design of sustainable building from Oxford Brookes University, um, their School of Architecture. Um, I specialise in building performance, life cycle assessment of buildings, natural um, construction materials and net zero. Um, I co-founded co um, a company called Fab Hub Project last year, which was, um, I'm sitting in a Fab Hub, in the only Fab Hub in that photograph there, uh, wearing the same jumper. I decided to brand myself tonight. Um, we were going to be producing um, timber frame tiny homes, um, but unfortunately that business is closing down due to a variety of reasons. However, I'm taking what I've learnt and evolving that into a sustainability consultancy, um, focusing on people and planet positive buildings. Um, and what I do is there's three separate strands. I do advocacy, so I have a role as head of special projects for um, a foundation in the construction industry called the Sustainable Development Foundation, um, where I am currently running um, a campaign to do with COP26, um, and I'm also looking at strategic um, projects for them. I, as it says here, I co-founded What the Climate Action Group with Nicola, and I lead with Tom on the Homes Energy Project, um, and I collaborate with other professionals um, in my network to share and disseminate knowledge. Um, I teach, um, so I, um, I teach at Oxford Brookes and also at um, the University of Westminster and also do some tutoring at the University of West of England in Bristol um, and I do a variety of subjects but in the autumn I'm going to be teaching on performance modelling and building physics which sounds about as scary as it actually is um, and I teach architects and other designers about climate literacy and I'm going to be running carbon literacy courses soon. And then in my practice, I do retrofit planning for homes and energy modelling and life cycle assessment for residential projects. I don't particularly focus on commercial buildings. Um, I prefer small scale um, that I can understand a little more easily. So that's me. <clears throat> um, what I'm going to talk about this evening, um, I won't go through this. This is what I'm going to talk about. Lots of things to do with buildings. Um, specifically on retrofitting which will come towards the end i've only really briefly touched on it because we're going to run um, a session later in the year all about retrofitting all of these subjects in themselves could be an hour's conversation so i've just kind of scratched the surface um which is hard because there's a lot to say um so retrofitting especially is quite important for us in watlington um for our project so we will have a separate meeting on that later in the year so first of all just to introduce you and set the scene um, to thinking about the definition of sustainability um, and what that means um, so this um, definition called the Brundtland definition was created in the 1980s um, and it was the first time um, anyone had tried to um, create a definition of what it means to be sustainable so bear in mind this was in um, the times the time of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan when there was very much um, a view that Earth's resources were unlimited um, but this, the Brundtland Commission came up with this definition, the develop, which is development which meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Um, so it's meant to say we won't do anything now that will um, cause problems in the future. But it hasn't really worked because obviously the way that economic growth works um, means that we just drive growth constantly. Um, and you might hear this talked about triple talked about as triple bottom line sustainability, where there's supposedly a balance between environmental protection, social progress and economic development. But basically economic growth takes over. 
Um, but we need to be careful because um, to live within our means. And this is a lovely image from NASA, um, which really, if you see that thin blue, the darker blue line that's over the edge of the planet, um, that is our atmosphere. And we live on that in that tiny sliver of, um, of space between um, the ground and space. And it's extremely fragile and we have to be really careful with it. We're not doing that at the moment. Um, we are meet, I think we're very near to what's called Earth Overshoot Day. I think it's next week in the UK, which is at what point in the year has a country used so many resources they can't be renewed um, in a year. In, in On average, globally, um, consumption um, and emissions actually are worth about 1.6 Earths per year. Um, and then you look at individual countries south korea seems to be the worst offender i'm not exactly sure why they consume the equivalent of 8.4 south koreas each year um there in the uk we we consume nearly four U united kingdoms in terms of resources every year um so we do need to be careful to make sure in the future in order to be sustainable we can't keep going like this we need to um, act with compassion for our planet um this is a very interesting graphic um, which i found today um the carbon map and um, the carbon map project which um, and i would ask you to if anyone wants to guess what these different maps mean um at the top left there but i'm going to tell you because we don't have time um the top left there um is an orthographic projection of earth and all the countries and the color coding is just continents um i'm going to highlight them actually the top right um is current contributions to um greenhouse gas emissions um, sorry, actually, the top left is land area, um, so it's not actually an exact graphical projection because it better represents land area. Um, current contribution to emissions is the top right, so which continents are emitting the most in terms of greenhouse gases. Um, bottom left is the historic contribution to emissions, so that really reflects the fact that Britain, you can see there, is hugely distorted, really drove the Industrial Revolution. Um, and um, then the bottom right is where do people live who are at risk from climate change? And you can see that that is hugely, I mean, we're not going to really be affected in terms of climate change issues so much here, although we are at risk from sea level rise, which is one of the main issues here. Um, but countries um, like Russia, China, the whole of the Indian um, subcontinent, Bangladesh, Malaysia, everything in the Indian Ocean is at huge risk, um, and to a lesser extent, Africa. Um, but basically, it's the Global South. So if you hear um, talk about the Global South being heavily impacted by climate change, that's because of this, because the areas that will have the impact, the heating, the sea level rise, um, will be broadly the South, um, and also where um, economies are less well developed, so they're less able to cope. Um, the UK, we are proud to say, our government is proud to say that we are halfway to our 2050 target of net zero. Um, this is quite an interesting um, view of the world. So the target in the UK is to reduce, um, sorry, I'm jigging around a bit, is to reduce emissions to net zero by 2050. And what that means is that allows for carbon capture and carbon trading and various dubious things like that. Um, but we've done quite well in the last 30 years. We seem to have reduced our emissions by roughly half, which is excellent news. However, much of that has been to do with the fact that we've stopped using coal um, to generate electricity. And we've also um, offshored a lot of our manufacturing. So we've deindustrialized our economy in that time. Um, which means that an awful lot of our emissions are now exported um, to other countries and they account for those and we don't account for them. Um, we've also cleaned up some of our own industry um, that's left behind. Um, so if we took out, um, if we took out those externalities, we would actually only have reduced our emissions by roughly 10%, um, which is a problem. But the government is trying to tackle that um, by introducing um, the counting of emissions to do with aviation and shipping. They announced that a couple of weeks ago. Um, and there is going to be discussion this year at the climate conference um, how as to how um, emissions to do with um, production of consumer goods will be accounted for moving forwards. Oh, there may, there may also be a COVID, what's called a COVID rebound. So because there's been contraction in economies globally and greenhouse gases didn't really go down last year, but they might actually bounce back far worse than they were before um, in the coming year or two. Um, 
So our climate change commitments in the UK, what do they look like? Um, well, the government recently announced an increase in ambition for the targets aiming to reduce emissions now by 78% by 2035. And there's plenty of talk of the um, United States as has declared that they will, under Joe Biden, has declared that they will reduce their emissions by half by the end of the decade. And that is broadly accepted to be what's required in order to get to zero or to net zero by 2050. Um, is that we have to halve emissions by 2030. Um, as I just mentioned, we, um, the UK will now include aviation and shipping, and we are also hosting in Glasgow this November, all being well, because it was postponed from last year, um, the next conference of the parties, which is the Climate Change Conference. And um, this is called COP26, um, and it's hosted in Glasgow in November, hopefully. Um, I'm going to skip over this one. Um, if any of you have heard about donut economics, then there's some interesting points there about a different way to view the economic model. And this is quite relevant, and I apologise for the quality of this image, I didn't have time to recreate it. Um, there are conversations in the construction industry about how, the con how buildings can start to contribute to positive climate impacts rather than negative climate impacts. And there's been a, um, a really important project run over the last four years called Restore, um, which is thinking about how to move to regenerative practices in the built environment by using different types of materials, different planning um, methods, um, encouraging people to occupy their buildings in different ways. So this is just kind of moving us along um, from conventional on the left here, which is bad because we're using up resources and consuming them too quickly. Even as we move through green and sustainable, we're still using materials um, every year, new materials. And we need to move to a situation where we are using less, being more efficient, being sustainable. And what sustainable means is that we actually start to restore natural environments and regenerate um, our natural environments. Um, and this requires really high level holistic thinking um, and very much considering how the built environment can act positively um, for climate change. What might that mean? Um, we need buildings to benefit people as well as the planet. Um, we spend about 90% of our time indoors. Um, we know that buildings have a huge impact on climate change, but they can be made to be positive. There are solutions to that already. Um, climate change will have a huge impact on buildings, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. We need to ensure that they're resilient um, and that they're suitable um, for people to live in them in the future. And that's actually going to be an issue in this country um, in terms of overheating risks uh, moving forwards. We also want buildings to deliver social value. This is a real um, problem. Um, not so much in this country, although it does exist um, with social inequality, and it's been very much highlighted by the COVID pandemic is people living in overcrowded, poor quality housing have really suffered from um, the pandemic much more greatly in this country um, because of where they live is unhealthy and overcrowded um, and they don't have access to outdoor space. Um, we know that healthy buildings mean healthy people and a healthy planet and we want to be able to live within Earth's resources. So it all sounds very lovely, doesn't it? Um, I've just realised I can't see any of you and I'm finding it a bit disconcerting. So I'm just going to fiddle with my fiddle with my screen for a second. Right. OK, so climate change 101 greenhouse effect it's actually a good thing if we didn't have we, we talk about it for decades as a bad thing um the greenhouse effect but if we didn't have the greenhouse effect and apology if you already know this if we didn't have it life on earth wouldn't exist the fact that we have an atmosphere and we have carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in that atmosphere means that some of the sun's energy is trapped um, and warms the earth um, and warms the air and warms the oceans and makes it um makes earth as far as we know, the only livable place in the entire universe. Um, so it's our home and we have to protect it. Um, Earth's surface temperature on average is around 15 degrees Celsius. Without the greenhouse effect, it would be minus 18 degrees Celsius, which wouldn't really be conducive to life. Um, but what's happening is um, carbon, and I'll tell you in a minute what I mean by, by carbon. Um, there's a balance. There's a cycle um, called the carbon cycle where plants um, and lots of other things um, help us by providing and by sucking up the carbon dioxide and the other emissions and giving us oxygen so that we can breathe um, and that's all been kept in balance for millions of years although it has fluctuated um, but since the industrial revolution we've been digging out historic um, fossil fuels out of the ground and burning them which is throwing that system out of balance um, roughly half the excess emissions since the industrial revolution have been absorbed by the oceans which are acidifying which is causing coral 
reef bleaching that's quite hard to say um, and well there are projections that the coral reefs might not exist by the end of the century which is obviously a drastic thing to realize um, and even if we stopped emitting all greenhouse gases today um, it would take 800 years to return the planetary system to equilibrium so it isn't just a case of switching this stuff off it's actually working out how we can regenerate the planet and move ourselves into different systems um, and ways of working that will actually be survivable for the future and i'm sorry to sound depressing but i wanted to give you the facts <laughs> um, this is a chart showing atmospheric co2 um, yes it's a bit scary isn't it i looked it up today's um, co2 emissions are 418 parts per million and it's increasing at about two and a half parts per million per year so prior to the um, industrial revolution it was about it was less than 300 parts per million um, um co2 emissions haven't been this high during human history they have been this high in the past um but not when there's been much life on earth um i want to just make a quick mention on carbon so i often say carbon and sometimes i'll say co2 um, and I generally, and I apologise to anyone who's a chemical engineer or an earth scientist in the audience, um, these terms are generally used interchangeably, and I might say greenhouse gases too, just to confuse you. Um, carbon um, is used as a catch-all to describe the main greenhouse gases um, standardised to what's called CO2E, so CO2 equivalent. Um, so this is saying if we've got the main greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and the various nasties, HFCs in this. Um, whatever um they all of the others have much higher um warming um effects than carbon dioxide so methane for example which is um emitted mainly by um cows and sheep burping when they eat um is 30 i thought it was 35 36.75 times um more in terms of its warming effect than carbon dioxide so co2 equivalent means the equivalent amount of methane that would be the same as one unit of carbon dioxide so we're standardizing everything to co2 equivalent so sorry to confuse you but carbon just means all of the greenhouse gases um and then there on the right is just a really nice um demonstra um infographic that shows the breakdown of emissions and where they come from um so this is from 2016 49.4 billion tonnes of CO2e, which is incomprehensible. I don't even know how to visualise what that means. But the majority of it, as you can see, almost three quarters is from energy production. Um, so this is the burning of fossil fuels causing these greenhouse gas emissions. The, much of the rest of it is from industry. So cement in its own right, um, because of the way the chemical processes that happen when cement is produced, you get emissions from cement production. And that's virtually impossible to eliminate. Uh, in fact, it is impossible to eliminate. You would have to eliminate cement to get rid of that. Um, and then agriculture and forestry and land use changes. So that's cutting down forests to create farmland for cows to graze, for example. Um, but energy production and energy usage in industry and homes and transport is the dominant element here. Some of you might have seen this um, graphic before. Um, it's also a little bit alarming. It's the last 150 years, average temperature compared to an average of around, I think it's 1970 to 2000. Um, so what it shows us is in the history, in 150 years ago, it was cooler than it is now, and it's getting warmer quite quickly, and we're getting lots of hot years. So these are called um, climate stripes and were developed by someone over at the University of Reading. And this is the global, um, the global picture, and you can break it down by lots of different regions. Um, this is obviously getting quite hot here now. So where are we? Um, in terms, so I mentioned COP26 that's coming up in the autumn. Um, in 2015, the Paris Climate Accord was signed um, and scientists and governments agreed that there was a safe limit of one and a, a safe limit of one and a half degrees of warming. Um, where are we now? We are already at 1.1 or 1.2 degrees warming um, in 2020. So we're getting perilously close to that 1.5 degree limit um we're going to overshoot that substantially um current pledges and targets bring us to about 2.4 percent current policies so that's not the same as pledges and targets things that are actually happening at the moment would, would potentially deliver um a plus 2.9 degree um amount of warming by mid by the end of the century um and that could be potentially catastrophic so we know that at one and a half degrees of warming there will be climate related risks to human health food security biodiversity and water supplies um 
and what we've got at the moment is not enough so there is hope that especially with america coming back in and with lots of other countries especially china making pledges now that things might begin to change because i think it, realistically it, we are in an emergency now and i think that is being recognized what does it mean um we've got one degree and rising it's, it's just you know it's not one degree everywhere. Some places have got five degrees of extra heat. The Arctic is seeing wildfires inside the Arctic Circle. The, the Antarctic ice sheet is starting to melt. Um, we know that heat is getting stored in the ocean. So the excess heat and the excess emissions get stored in the oceans. So the oceans are acidifying, but they're also really warm, which is driving huge, huge storms. Um, and there's lots of other um, observed impacts already. So lots of places um, in the Indian Ocean are already getting overwhelmed by the ocean and people can't live there anymore. So there's climate refugees all over the world already. Um, and then there's a sad story of the, I'm not going to try, I think Octugal, they call it the OK Glacier, which is in Iceland. And um, there's a memorial to the OK Glacier in Iceland because it disappeared in 2016 and was declared officially dead. Um, because it could no longer move under its own weight anymore. And that's how a glacier is defined. Um, so they put up an, a memorial to it um, in Iceland, and they think that all the Atlantic glaciers will go this way in the next 30 years. Um, a letter to the future. <laughs> in the next 200, oh, in the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow this same path. This monument is acknowledging what we know, that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you know if we did it. So this is August 2019, when the CO2 was 415 parts per million that's incredibly sad um and i see people standing in front of us making me feel upset just reading that um maybe we can stand there in 20 or 30 years and say that we've changed it and things will be getting better um and but that's what they did in iceland um they put up this plaque after this glacier died that's what it used to look like it had like this amazing kind of smiley face on it when viewed from space anyway Quick question for you. I don't know if anyone wants to answer. Which was hotter, the long hot summer of 1976 or summer 2018? It's hard to remember. Apparently it's impossible for us to remember any more than five years worth of weather. But I don't remember the summer of 1976. I was a baby that year. My mum remembers it and tells me about it. Um, anyone want to hazard a guess or shall I just continue? I'll just continue. And the answer is they were broadly the same. However, and well, in 1976, there were 18 consecutive days in the UK when the temperature was higher than 30 degrees, which sounds hot, doesn't it? Um, but this is 1976 and this is 2018. In 1976, the UK was just having some weird weather. Um, we were stuck under like a block in high pressure and the weather didn't change for a really long time and it was really hot. Two years ago, it was hot everywhere. So this is the dramatic difference. This is weather. This is climate. Um, and it, that's a really dramatic way to think about how the climate's changing. Um, in 2016, there was quite a dramatic heat wave in Europe where there were 36 consecutive days with temperatures higher than 25 degrees Celsius. Um, it led to drought, crop failures, excess deaths and excess hospitalizations in Europe. Um, and what I want to say, and I'm really sorry to carry on depressing you, this is the coolest it's going to be. In the last decade, we've had the nine, nine of the 10 warmest years on record in the last 10 years. The only one of the top 10 years in terms of warm. Sorry, the only, sorry, hello, I've forgotten how to talk. Um, only one of the top 10 years have been outside the last decade, and that was 2005. So it wasn't even that long ago. The top two warmest years on record are 2016 and 2020. Um, so, like I say, I heard someone say this a couple of weeks ago in a presentation, it's the coolest it's going to be. What does that mean for our buildings? Well, I'll just move on at pace if that's okay. Um, how will climate change affect our buildings? Um, how many days we require heating and how many days we require cooling will change. So as part of my um, master's, um, I did my dissertation on um, heating and cooling energy demand in different types and different standards of housing, looking at um, homes built to building regulations and homes built to passive house. Um, and I analysed lots of different things, including future weather effects and decarbonisation of the grid. Um, but one of the things I looked at was the effect of how many heating days we'll have and how many cooling days we'll have. Now, in the UK, we don't really use cooling appliances as a standard. So in America, like 95% of homes have air conditioning installed, even if they're in the cold northern states. Um, but we don't really have that here. But in the future, not even that far in the future, 
our average temperatures, um, according to the, what's called the central projections for um, the central climate change scenarios, suggest that by 2030, our average temperatures will be the same as Paris or Salzburg, which they really already are in terms of the weather that we see each summer. By 2050, um, it will be similar to Bordeaux or Bilbao, so you're getting towards the southern parts of Europe. Um, and Bordeaux is a lovely sunny part of southern France. Um, Bilbao, quite a lot further south. Um, by 2080, so in the lifetimes of our children, the lifetimes of some of us, um, we might have an average temperature in London um, similar to places in Italy or the very south of France or places in the east of Europe where they don't have the benefits of, um, you know, the ocean weather systems. This isn't great. We don't have buildings that are built to withstand overheating in summer. In Bordeaux, the typical house has thick stone walls and tiny windows with external shutters. They don't really overheat in summer because of the way they're constructed. We haven't built our homes in this country for the future climate and we need to be aware of that. We'll also see increasingly drier periods. So this is looking at March, April and May last year um, and where it's browner is where it's drier than average. So um, the darkest brown is only 20% of average rainfall um, during the spring last year. However, also last year were these floods, crazy floods and crazy floods are happening more and more um, and wildfires. Oh, what fun. Um, in 2019, and I remember hearing about this in the news, in 2019, the UK had had more wildfires by April than any other year on record. This is a picture from somewhere in Derbyshire. I mean, it looks like something out of Lord of the Rings, doesn't it? It's terrifying. Um, there are consequences of climate change because obviously it's much drier in the winter. And so the heathland um, and the peat bogs are dry. Um, but it creates a feedback loop because when peat bogs burn, they emit a huge amount of stored carbon um, and they don't really recover in the same way that a grassland would. Um, in my page down, stopped working again. We need to start adapting our buildings for climate risks. So this is something that happened in France um, a couple of years ago, thinking about the heat wave they had in 2003. Um, when they knew there was a heat wave coming two years ago, they created these outdoor pools um, in Paris and they created cool rooms in public buildings so that if you lived in an apartment that just overheated you could go at night time and sleep on a camp bed in like a railway station um, because it was the only place that you would be safe and that you wouldn't die of overheating. Um, enormous number of excess deaths due to um, the risk of overheating um, and that's going to continue in the future in Europe um, and I know I'm only talking about Europe but this is kind of I, I mainly focus on the UK, but obviously these impacts are going to be far worse in plenty of other countries. Um, the issue of overheating is really important. Thermal comfort um, is a really basic requirement for how people can function in buildings. I've picked a really lovely sunny picture of a building there that might make you all go, oh, wouldn't that be a lovely place to go on holiday? Yes, it probably would be. But what about if you lived there and it faced south and it was hot every day? You lived on the top floor. Um, we need to be comfortable in our homes. We need to be comfortable to sleep. Um, it's it, we can't sleep when it's too hot at night. Um, overheating is linked to not just temperature but humidity, and then you get poor air quality, and then people start getting respiratory problems. Um, and vulnerable um, inhabitants are really um, susceptible to um, being hospitalised um, during long periods of um, high temperatures. Um, we also know that if people do install cooling systems in their homes, they're most, much less likely to be able to adapt. Um, and in America, there's been a few strange cases where people, they'll go into their office buildings in the summer or even their homes wearing a jumper because it's 40 degrees outside and it's 19 degrees inside with the cooling on. And they'll go outside and have a heart attack because their body can't cope with the temperature change. And that's, sorry, that's not funny, but that is kind of, it's a, we're creating a loop for ourselves because cooling needs energy to run and, uses um, horrible gases that leak into the atmosphere to run those systems. Um, so we need to just be cleverer with the way we design our buildings. And it's perfectly possible to shade buildings, to insulate them, to prevent heat gain, to create what's called passive design tactics to, um, so not passive house, but passive design tactics to just enable homes to be cooled down at night. So I'm going to get replacement windows in my house soon, and I'm gonna make sure that they can be thrown open at night as soon as the sun's gone down so that I can just get what's called purge ventilation through my house 
so that the cool evening air as soon as the sun's disappeared can rush back through my house so we need to start planning and designing buildings like that um the role of buildings in climate change is next so this is from the ipcc report on buildings um there's lots of different numbers and i apologize because they're not entirely consistent in my presentation because they've come from different sources but in 2010 it was reported that buildings account for about a third of total global final energy use i mean this might double or even triple by 2030 and i'll show you on the next page why that is um this is predominantly because billions of people in developing countries need access to adequate housing electricity and better cooking facilities so we can't stand in the way of social development and rising pe um, you know moving people up out of poverty um, but we need to be cautious of the fact that lots of those people will end up in cities and buildings have really long lifespans so we need to make sure we're not locking in issues for the future and that what we build now I and mean, i've got a really interesting page in a second about what shanghai looks like um, that we're not building in problems for the future as we are creating more and more buildings um, we also know that the way people inhabit their buildings um, and changes in behavior so if you create a building that can be more easily heated by retrofitting it people just tend to turn the thermostat up because it costs them less now so they can be more comfortable so you have an re interesting rebound effect um the impact of buildings will increase um partly because of population growth means that the number of households will go up um but also because homes are getting larger um uh, you know people will move into cities and will move into apartments who previously weren't really living in a building as such um in developing countries um so the number of households will increase in the space that people occupy will take up in terms of building i don't know if that made sense um how many people there are per household will go down um because there will be more households and fewer people living in them um on average um, and the energy used for heating and cooling should also decrease because things will get more efficient and the grid will be decarbonized but if we've got more houses and more people it means that the impact of buildings will go up and that's true for both residential and commercial buildings this is a really interesting picture um we know that populations and cities will continue to grow um people moving out of poverty moving into cities for jobs something like 70 percent of the population of the planet will live in cities in by by the year 2050 um as you build cities they're built out of materials that can't be easily decarbonized oh so by decarbonized i mean can you create something or do something in a way that removes the amount of emissions that's being created so for example we decarbonized electricity production in the uk by switching off coal-fired power stations in favor of gas turbine power stations and renewable energy sources like wind and solar and also the use of nuclear power um, but some things in construction so concrete the use of cement um, the extraction of sand um, these things can't be decarbonized because by their nature they emit um, when they're produced especially cement which has its own little slice if you remember from the earlier um, from the earlier page it's about three percent of global um, co2 emissions and um, so this is a picture of shanghai and if i just page down this is shanghai in 1987 this is Shanghai now, and this is happening all over China and all over the world, but the majority of it in China. Um, and I read the Bill Gates book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, um, last month, and one of his surprises, so he published his top 10 surprises. Um, we will build on planet Earth the equivalent of a new New York City every month for the next 40 years. That is an unbelievable amount of construction that's going to happen, um, and that's kind of what we're facing um yes this is where we've got one of the inconsistent numbers so this is generally used in the construction industry to describe the impact of buildings um this is from the world um green building council um they say that buildings account for nearly 40 percent of global annual emissions um and they have there are two components to that there is what called what's called operational carbon emissions of buildings which is in the red which is about 28 percent um, and then embodied carbon of construction so this is the emissions associated with extraction of raw materials production of bricks and insulation products and transport to site and the construction um, itself of buildings um, accounts for about 11 percent um, of annual carbon emissions now that's called embodied carbon I'm just gonna have a quick drink this is the one of the areas where i do some of my research um, because if you use different materials like timber for example you can kind of switch that off because you can create a building that stores carbon instead of being a net emitter of carbon 
Um, so that's a little bit alarming. Um, in the UK, we regulate for operational carbon. So we have the building regulations and we say that if you are going to have your lights on or you're going to use your boiler to heat your um, rooms and to heat your hot water, those things are regulated. They're called regulated emissions. Um, and so operational emissions are broadly speaking controlled and limited and they will be reduced over time. So when you hear the government talking about net zero homes, they are pretty much talking about operational emissions um, and captured here as well as operational water use, which we should also think about, but that's not an area um, of expertise um, that I have. Um, I mainly look at energy performance. Um, what we don't regulate for is embodied emissions, but embodied emissions are actually more complicated. Um, so it starts at the extraction of raw materials, to manufacture, to the construction of the building, to the transport to the site, the operation of the building which is operational but maintenance so if you have to replace the cladding or the facade or the windows or the doors or the boiler or anything that gets replaced in the building during its life all counts as embodied emissions so the big red line there um, circles everything that happens during the building's lifetime that is embodied emissions and that includes demolition and deconstruction and disposal of that building at the end of its life so there's a big argument about life cycle assessment and how that ought to be done as standard in the construction industry con to consider how much stuff we're putting into our buildings and how that could be made more efficient. Um, I'm not sure if I've taken the slide out, but the way you can create a high performing home is typically by putting more insulation into it and putting triple glazed windows. I mean, those are the two really simple things you can do, but those are the things that have the highest embodied carbon. Um, so insulation materials typically have really high embodied carbon um, in terms of their mass, um, much more even than cement. Um, and triple glazing is highly inefficient in terms of its production and the amount of carbon that goes into manufacturing those units, especially considering the short lifespan. Um, and there needs to be discussion about whether or not that those embodied emissions, first of all, you emit them now, they've gone into the atmosphere now when you've produced that product. Um, but also, are you ever going to get a payback in terms of what you can save um, in terms of operational emissions by putting triple glazing into your house or by putting extra um, polystyrene based insulation into the floor, for example. Um, but I could talk for three hours about that. So I'll stop now. <laughs> um, so focusing on homes. Um, in terms of operational energy, end use, can you hear me okay still, Nicola? Yeah, in terms of operational energy, end uses, um, nearly two thirds of energy in homes is used for heating. Um, so this is energy at the moment, this isn't thinking about emissions, so this is taking away um, how we might decarbonise or what fuel sources are used. This is just energy consumption in your home. So if you look at your bills, um, your, if you've got gas heating, um, your bills are probably like mine three quarters is gas in terms of energy consumption not cost and the other quarter will be electricity so to run all my appliances and you know my telly and my fridge and my cooking and um, those things are all electric now electricity costs quite a lot more about three or four or five times more than gas so gas is cheap but we use more of it um there's one um, the particular issue here is that cooling isn't considered a regulated energy end use in the UK at the moment because we don't have cooling appliances as standard. So that's an oversight in terms of the building regulations. And if we start to see cooling appliances put into homes as standard, which we not at the moment, um, but if we do, cooling is much more energy hungry than heating um, and will just replace heating as a massive chunk of energy use and emissions. Well, what does that look like for the future? Well, to reach net zero, that 2050 point um, I showed you in the context at the beginning, the most significant change we need to make is how we heat our homes. Um, so I've got part of the page covered up. Let me just move that. This is a proposal from um, an organisation called the Energy Systems Catapult, which is um, a government kind of research institute i think or they're funded by the government um to carry out research into what the future might look like for the electricity grid and energy use in the uk um, and this is a breakdown for homes um, of um, consumption in terms of households so this is a tiny bit confusing because it's not the same as the previous chart where i've shown you um 
energy end uses that are regulated so heating hot water lighting and appliances um, this is everything that a household contributes in terms of its emissions um, so this includes when you've got people living in a home you have transport emissions you have waste you have your diet you have your holidays you have um, all of those other things you're flying on an airplane and um, they all contribute to your household's carbon footprint um, but to reduce our household's carbon footprint we need to make a massive effort to reduce the impact of heating in our homes um, how are we going to do that that's going to be quite hard because 85 percent of homes in the uk um, use gas for heating um, and those that so this shows all homes on the left those that are on gas in the middle and those that are not on gas on the right um, ones that are not on gas are generally on um, oil or lpg um, or some are using coal um, still um, some of them are on electric heating so um, storage heaters or um, air source heat pumps. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. Um, and they will tend to be the more efficient ones. Older homes that have oil and LPG um, will be much less efficient. So that's why you've got so many. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G are called the SAP ratings. Um, and A is the most efficient. And you can hardly see that. There are no red, there are no red bars on the top of those stacks, are there? Um, an awful lot of inefficient homes there that are off gas. So we've got to concentrate on getting properties the not on gas to something else um, and that something else can't be gas because we can't start now installing gas boilers we need to think about electrifying heat um, gas itself is it's really impossible to decarbonize you can't decarbonize gas when you burn it it emits um, you have a gas fired power station over there in didcot they use gas to power the turbines and it creates electricity um, you can decarbonize the electricity grid by moving to renewables and having more nuclear in the grid and by having local energy grids as well. Um, but to get rid of gas as a supply that directly comes into homes is really difficult. And so there's a big shift towards um, focusing on air source heat pumps um, for the future. But um, from, the, from my personal perspective, as someone who works in this area, it isn't just as easy as switching your boiler for a heat pump. It, it won't work. You'll need to replace your whole heating system. And really you should make your home more efficient first. Um, to make sure that that heat pump works because otherwise your your fuel bills will just go up three or four times because even though that unit is more efficient um it will still cost you more money to run unless you do some upgrades to your home first um i won't dwell on that this is carbon intensity of fuels for different heating alternatives so carbon intensity is how many um kilograms of co2 are emitted per kilowatt hour of um, energy um, of power used um, of heat um, used so for example if you have a coal fired boiler or you're using a coal fire in your house you're emitting nearly um, half a kilo of co2 for every kilowatt hour you're generating now bear in mind an average house might take 100 kilowatt hours a day in the winter to heat um, that's um, that's quite a lot 50 kilos of co2 a day if you're using coal now not many people are but heating oil and lpg are are better than that but not much better mains gas is about 216 um, grams per kilowatt hour um, which the majority of us are, are using um, those things haven't changed national grid electricity is coming down um, because as i said they've switched off coal um, so that's a little bit better um, and then using heat pumps and having different biomass um, solutions helps you reduce the amount of co2 being emitted per kilowatt hour so i won't dwell on this anymore but it's not it's not as easy as just switching from gas to electric heating because it's really complicated to change at an individual property level. Um, and even if we did that, we wouldn't be able to supply all the houses in one go um, because there isn't enough um, capacity in the grid. So we have to make our homes more efficient first. This is a suggestion of what the evolution of heating systems might look like in the UK. And there's obviously a big focus on phasing out gas boilers and replacing with air source heat pumps. Um, so a ASHP is air source heat pumps and GSHP is ground source heat pumps to keep direct electric, which is just heaters that you plug in um, and they just give out heat. Um, that includes storage heaters and then what's called district heating, which is kind of centralized production of heat that's then distributed locally. Um, so that's distribu distribution of heat rather than distribution of electricity locally. Um, and that is gaining favour in cities because it's reasonably, well, 
it's reasonably straightforward. I wouldn't say it's easy. It's much more straightforward in a city um, setting to put district heating. But gas boilers are being phased out for new homes by, um, oh, I want to say 2023, but it might be 2024. Um, so you can't install a gas boiler in a new home from then. Um, they will also eventually phase out probably quite quickly replacement gas boilers. Um, so if your gas boiler fails, at some point you'll no longer be able to have a new gas boiler um, but it will probably be like at the moment where you've got single glazing in your old house is they will say oh heritage requirements tell you that you have to still have single glazing it's obviously massively inefficient but there will i'm sure be cases where um, gas boilers will carry on being replaced by gas boilers um not necessarily the way that we're going to win plenty of talk about hydrogen and how hydrogen might work as a direct replacement for gas the chemistry of that is dubious and and I am in an echo chamber of people who work in sustainability, but from what I understand, it's basically a lobbying effort by the fossil fuel industry to be able to carry on making stuff and digging stuff out of the ground. Um, the production of hydrogen is highly inefficient and you might as well just do something simpler than try to use electricity electrolysis to create hydrogen from water. It's just ridiculous. Um, anyway, it uses so much energy to do it. it it's, 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 it's a misnomer. Anyway, moving on. Um, how a building is designed and maintained is quite important. So this is a nice diagram um, that's called the skin and bones diagram. When you think about a building and how it's um, made, um, the, the key components should be age layered so that the ones that need replacing are easy to access. So this is the analogy I give about my annoyance at having a children's coat where the zip broke, like a really high quality children's coat where the zip broke. <clears throat> and that's ridiculous because it renders the coat useless in the winter. Um, and it's really expensive to have a zip replaced unless luckily like me, my mom is really handy with a sewing machine. So she just did that for me, but I would have gone out otherwise and bought a new hundred pound children's coat. And that's ridiculous. So we need to make sure with our buildings in the same way that we have access and items like windows are reasonably easy to replace and we replace them properly and we make sure they perform as intended. Um, we also need to make sure that the things that are underneath the structure of the building are going to last for a very long time. And my personal preference is to make buildings out of timber, if possible, or other natural materials. And um, so you to use natural insulation materials rather than plastic based insulation materials, because then the building acts as a sink. So if and we have thousand year old buildings in the UK, um, we've got homes in Watlington that are hundreds of years old. Yeah, and they might look they, they, they're very quaint and they're lovely and they probably do leak quite a lot of heat, but they're storing an enormous amount of carbon in those really old timbers. Um, so we shouldn't plan to um, demolish buildings after 60 years, which is what the building regulations say we should do. And we need to make sure that we are using buildings wisely and we're able to update them when necessary. Um, I've mentioned that already. This is just looking at the market uptake of home energy efficiency measures. Um, so this exactly follows when the government has offered incentives to, to do things that are simple. So, you know, in the 70s, um, central heating got introduced and I where I when I was a kid we didn't have central heating in my house my parents left that house in 1994 and there was still wasn't a central heating system in that house um but it was a small house and we just put jumpers on and had heaters um but central heating is fairly normal now um hot water tank insulation was introduced in the 70s and 80s and nearly all homes have that now um, loft insulation has been heavily um, subsidised in the past by the government and is really simple to do really cheap to do and really effective um when it's done properly um, and there's hardly any lofts really left I mean something like that the blue dots there show there's maybe 10 percent of homes that have the potential to have insulated lofts there's only about 10 percent of homes left um, what's the green one I can't quite understand draft proofing draft proofing is harder um, because um, you have to chase those drafts and you have to know how to effectively get rid of them without creating issues of mold growth for example because if you get rid of a draft and it's letting fresh air through then by sealing up that draft you might create um mold um double glazing is obviously becoming more common um it's really common now it's, it's the the norm for new builds and um, but really common to replace single glazing with double glazing now unless you've got a heritage building cavity wall insulation was heavily subsidized in the 90s and noughties um but stopped um and then we've got plenty of other things here like um air source heat pumps 
and then you notice as you do with the climate change charts is suddenly there'll be a huge uplift and, and this is to do with the way that the market um, needs to develop and how government will incentivize householders to carry out the changes that are needed um, and there's a really big focus at the moment on social housing and um, so homes that are for social rent um, but we we need to, there's a lot of those homes might be four million social rented homes in the uk but private rented homes and privately owned homes are in the majority and there's no massive incentive for us to do anything um, if we're in that sector at the moment so and heat pumps is the obvious one that's coming down the line and nobody really knows what to do and the feedback i hear from installers is they get more complaints than positive reviews because homes aren't ready for them anyway moving on to watlington's carbon footprint so this is a an amazing tool that was set up um, I think only in March or early April called impacttool.org.uk which I noticed today was offline which is slightly disconcerting um, but there are two different ways of looking at the data here and apologies to Tom because I noticed that there was another data set and didn't let you know um, in time um, our carbon footprint in Watlington is measured by territory. So this is literally the area that Watlington takes up. Um, and the average carbon footprint there is stated as 12.7 tonnes of CO2e per household per year. Um, and the majority of that, so 4.7 tonnes, um, is from housing. There's another view, however, which shows um, based on our consumption of our households that are here. So because Watlington is quite affluent um, compared to the national average, um, we, we do consume more um, than the average. So housing roughly ends up at about a quarter. Um, you've got consumption of goods and services is actually the highest impact there. Travel is quite high and that, a lot of that is to do with the fact that we have to go somewhere to do practically anything from Watlington. You want to go to a swimming pool or a supermarket um, or a university or work then you almost always have to get in a car or on a bus or drive somewhere to get on a train. So transport impact um, in Watlington um, by household is high. Housing, however, is really quite high as well. And what's quite surprising is these figures here that show in terms of the subsets of housing, um, gas is a bit less than um, half. Um, electricity consumption and emissions um, is about a third. And then emissions from heating oil and LPG is um, on average a ton per household. So obviously many households don't have any of that. So there will be some households that have got really high emissions because they have heating oil still. Um, one of my neighbors has got heating oil and we've got gas in the street. Um, so that's, I think Tom was mentioning that just when I managed to rejoin the call. Um, we need to work out how in our project here we can help people access the ways that they can move themselves away from those especially when you reach a trigger point um, on your plan maintenance so your boiler needs replacing and can you move away from oil for example or can you move away from um, gas tanks um, can you get rid of your coal um, fireplace for example um, how does that compare to South Oxfordshire? So Watlington's on the left here now as a bar rather than a pie, um, and South Oxfordshire's on the right. The colours are the same, but these charts are slightly confusing, but I downloaded them as they are. Um, so what you've got there is goods and services. It's the biggest, smallest. They're stacked in order, which is a bit strange. Um, so housing is actually only the third largest in Watlington, but is the second largest in the whole of South Oxfordshire. However, our number is greater than the average of South Oxfordshire. So housing has 4.7 tonnes on average impact um, compared to 4.6 tonnes um, for South Oxfordshire. Then comparing to England as a whole, housing only has an impact of 2.9 tonnes um, per household on average, whereas in Watlington we've got well, 50 or 60 percent more on average. So it's a really big um, issue. Right, I'm going to try and talk for no more than five more minutes. Um, solutions for homes. There are a lot of old homes in the UK. We have a lot of old homes um, in Watlington. Um, I've got uh, a note here. Yeah, nearly 40% of our homes in the UK were constructed um, prior to 1945, and nearly a quarter are more than 120 years old, so they were pre-1900. Um, older homes tend to have solid wall construction, well, would typically have solid wall construction and are harder to heat to keep comfortable and harder to upgrade. So they, if you live in a solid wall property, it's generally classified as um, hard to treat. They call them hard to treat um, because it's really hard to put um, insulation on those walls without causing serious problems to the way that that wall will work. Um, you can trap moisture and cause all sorts of problems. Um, 
but we need to work out what to do with heritage buildings. Um, if we're looking forward to 2050 and we want to get to net zero in 2050 of the buildings that will exist then 80 percent of those buildings already exist today so we're going to be in a situation where we have to retrofit so renovate or retrofit all the buildings we have now which in the uk is something like 23 million buildings and 27 million households um they've already been built Never mind the fact that the ones that are currently being built aren't even being built to a standard that causes them to just be perfect forever. They're not being built to that standard now. Um, they won't be being built to that standard for at least another four years, which is frankly absurd, but I don't want to get into the politics. Um, we just need to build better and we need to enable people to retrofit. Um, sources of heat loss in homes um, are all over the place. So if you feel cold in a room and you've got draft, or your windows don't fit correctly or your loft isn't properly insulated or you've got you know uh, you've got a suspended timber floor air is getting out everywhere and if air is getting out heat is getting out um and wind is blowing across your building and and that's just heat so when you've got the flow of heat energy from the inside to the outside of your building because that's basic thermodynamics and heat moves from warm to cold so everywhere that you've got heat escaping is the extra heat you have to put into your building to keep yourself comfortable so you know if you live in an old leaky house or a more modern leaky house like i do if i turn the heating off for two days in the winter we are freezing cold so anyone that's had a broken boiler you desperately need someone to come and help you because two days after it's broken down you are really cold inside now because the inside is trying to reach equilibrium with the outside um in which case cuddle your dog and turn on all of your computers that's nice and warm um this is a thermal imaging project i did which i apologize still isn't quite complete i think there's about 15 homes who still haven't received them if you think you signed up for an image and you haven't received it please check your junk email because i have sent out about 35 of them now um, and a lot of them have ended up in junk. So they've come from an email address that's wakaghomesandenergy at gmail.com. So check that, please. These are just some images. So red is bad, blue is good, um, but they're all relative to each other. So you can't really compare these images to each other. Um, but this is my house. We've got this awful thermal bridge where we've got this little low pitched roof and it's causing the render to blow on the wall. So we're gonna have to have it re-rendered. This is a downpipe where there was obviously been raining. So the downpipe was, um, was just a bit warmer so it's showing up as warm our windows we're going to get our windows replaced this year our windows are not there our roof isn't so bad um but we need to have some repair done on the render and we need to have the windows and door replaced um there's a standard called the ebpd the uh, environmental performance of building direct now the energy performance of buildings directive which is an eu rule so it doesn't really apply anymore does it except for the government did adopt them all after brexit um which says that when major refurbishments are taking place um, and improvements are enforced, provided they are economically viable, which is interesting. Um, triggers to retrofit might include you've just moved to a new house, your family is growing, you need more space, or you're building an extension, or you've got plan maintenance. So we've got plan maintenance in our house. It's built in 1970. We really need to get the roof redone because the membrane's breaking down and the roof's starting to leak. So we're going to get the roof done, the render needs replacing and the windows need replacing. So all of a sudden I'm in a building mega situation where I've got to submit to the council for permission to do these things. So it's a trigger for me to say, OK, well, I'm going to sink some money into the house anyway for maintenance. I'll just spend a little bit more and make some extra changes to improve the building's performance. Um, and we know that in the future um, homes, there will be extra value associated with homes that perform better because it will be a requirement to have a certain um, performance standard. Um, I won't talk about that one and I won't talk about that one and I won't talk about that one because I'm running out of time. Um, generally speaking, when you are going to upgrade your home, there's a three step approach. First of all, save energy. So how can you reduce the energy consumption of your home for heating? So predominantly heating. Um, I mean, you can put energy efficient light bulbs and you can use hot water a bit less or turn down a thermostat. But ultimately, you've got to get rid of those drafts and gaps and leaks um, and poor performing windows from your house to conserve energy so that you, you, you're using less energy for heating. That is number one task is to reduce the energy demand. Then look at efficiency. Um, this 
triangle's kind of upside down, isn't it? Then look at efficiency next. So install efficient services, make sure your appliances are highly rated, make sure that your boiler is efficient, um, upgrade to a heat pump if it's time, but don't throw away a functioning five-year-old gas boiler in favour of a heat pump. That, that isn't advisable. You just carry on as you are because it will cost you more money, cost you to buy it, and it'll cost you more to run it, plus as the embodied carbon. So keep your gas boiler and keep it maintained until it needs replacing and then think about electrical heating. Only when you've done those things, so reduce the demand, use efficient services, and then look at offsetting some of that demand with renewable energy. So can you buy renewable energy from a supplier or can you put solar panels on your roof? I don't really know how I feel about solar panels because they are not recyclable at a global scale and they use a lot of um, nasty materials in their manufacture, but they are becoming more efficient and they're obviously, they obviously provide free energy and they're becoming radically cheaper. So even in the last five years, their cost has come down by something like three quarters. And then over the last 20 years, the cost has come down about 99%. It's just ridiculous compared to what it was. Um, so electrification, um, creating renewables um, and using electricity, um, especially if you could do that for heating in your home and you can charge your EV. Um, that's the last step. That's the thing you do at the end. Um, I want to talk about that. There are organisations all over the country delivering retrofit projects. I will hopefully be qualified to um, give advice at a whole house level um, later in the year. Um, our local provider is an organisation called Cozy Homes Oxfordshire, and I'm hoping to get them to speak to us as a group in the autumn. Um, and they deliver whole house deep retrofits. There are also other organisations that do different levels of retrofit. One of the key important things when we're thinking about um, buildings. Oh, I just realised I started late, didn't I? Because I wasn't first. OK, um, <laughs> so we need to think about occupant well-being. Um, do we have access to daylight? Do we have access to fresh air? Have we got access to open spaces? I mean, what a beautiful image this is um, just really to evoke the feeling of openness um, and space. Um, we need to make sure when we're upgrading our buildings that we're not over insulating them and not creating ventilation because that, that just creates an unhealthy building. So there's a rule of thumb, which is no insulation without ventilation. So you mustn't add insulation to your house unless you're going to think about um, ventilation systems. Um, what is a net zero home? Um, well, thinking about um, reducing the demand. So this is looking at the idea of passive house as a standard. So this is a low energy standard um, for homes. Um, passive house classic plus renewables um, tries to get towards a net zero standard because it's reducing the demand um, as much as is feasibly possible. Um, you're keeping out the cold, you're letting in the sunshine for the beneficial heating um, in the winter, but keeping it out in the summer. Um, and then you add on maybe a battery and some renewable storage, um, some renewable generation to get your house to net zero. So the operational performance is really good. So it's hardly using anything for heating. Um, and what is being used um, in the home is being generated on site. So that house might be classified as net zero. We're not talking about embodied emissions because that would be different. Um, notional buildings, which is what is required in the building regs, um, just says we'll reduce it a little bit and then just whack loads of solar panels on the roof and we'll call that zero um, because however much you're using is being generated on site. Now that's not quite the same um, and isn't necessarily the way we should go. Um, this link is working now. So if you get the presentation afterwards, you can go to this um, calculator and work out how much um, solar power you could generate from your roof. Um, lots of different ideas for how you could um, start to improve your home. And as I said, we'll talk about this later in the year on retrofitting in more detail. Um, but have a look at your building's um, EPC certificate. So if the building has been, if you've moved in, if you've bought your house within the last 10 years or you've had it surveyed for some other reason, like a revaluation, re and um, your home will have an EPC certificate. You can click on that link there and find out what the rating is. My house is a D. Um, there's talk about how all homes should be a C in the future. Um, and it will also give you a list of sometimes comedic recommendations for things that you can do. But a really simple thing we can all do is... Um, switch to a renewable energy supplier. Now, I've stolen this um, infographic from the Good Energy website, which shows the average fuel mix. Now, this is from three years ago, so it probably is better now in terms of renewables. The average fuel mix um, for electricity production in the UK, it looks like this. Um, good Energy, if you buy your electricity from them, it isn't what's supplied to your house, because what's supplied to your house is just coming from the grid, but you are paying 
a supplier who is only generating renewable energy. So in this case, good energy, they don't have anything that isn't renewable. Um, and there are plenty of other suppliers that have 100% renewable tariffs. We have a renewable tariff here um, where we also pay to offset the emissions for our gas. So we pay a little bit more, it's not much more. Um, and it means that we're also offsetting our gas um, emissions. Oh, and I think I'll probably stop there. Um, the construction industry is starting to tackle climate change with education, which is a bit late because we've got generations of architects and engineers that haven't been trained in this stuff. I'm getting involved in this, um, working with Oxford Brooks on how to educate all of their architects, not just the ones who are interested in sustainable design and all of their engineers and all of their urban planners. Um, this is nice. Um, if you've got time and you're interested, go and look up a website called Letty, London Energy Transformation Initiative. They've got loads of really amazing information. This is their kind of vision of what zero carbon buildings might look like. Um, and then there's a standard called the Future Home Standard, um, which you may have heard of, which was in consultation last year, where um, the building regulations called Part L, which is Conservation of Fuel and Power, um, will mean that all homes that are built from 2025 um, should be zero carbon ready, whatever the heck that was meant to mean, um, but the standards are improving. Um, sorry, I need to have a drink. This is um, a building um, refurbished. So that's what the building originally looked like and it wasn't knocked down, it was refurbished and now it looks like the building on the right. So they've created extra space by building balconies um, and improving the overall performance of the building. Um, Existing buildings are a really precious resource. Um, a guy called Scott McCauley, who set up the Anthropocene Architecture School, he has this phrase, mine the Anthropocene. Um, instead of extracting virgin materials from the earth, we should start extracting materials that we've already extracted once and using them. He said that it is easier and less energy intensive to get gold from old iPhones than it is to mine for it. So with that in mind, we should be reusing our existing buildings. That building on the left, and um, one, um, the, the architects of that building, they take this approach all the time. They they never touch, they never demolish anything. Um, they're called Lacaton and Basel, and they just won um, a really prestigious annual prize called the Pritzker Prize for Architecture based on retrofitting, and that had never been done before. Um, and that was one of their buildings. Not beautiful, is it? But it's the concept. Um, we need to think about how we can use timber in construction, although in high rises, that's not currently allowed in the UK and probably won't be because of um, the Grenfell disaster. Um, this is a beautiful building that I fully intend to visit as soon as I can, um, which is the first living building challenge accredited building in the UK. So it meets a really stringent set of requirements on healthy buildings. And it's in, um, it's in Yorkshire somewhere. Sorry, I'm struggling with my ears. Um, and it isn't just natural materials. Um, Harvard have recently completed another li living building challenge building um, on their campus um, where they've conducted an enormous lengthy academic research project where they involved thousands of manufacturers, where they invited them to send them the very best versions of their materials and they were going to analyze them for whether they were healthy, whether they were you know high emitting and harvard has not only built themselves an amazing building um, but they're creating um, a publicly available resource of healthy efficient sustainable materials um, and continue to run this building as a lab so um, it, it's an amazing place and it only very recently opened and if you're interested in um, buildings as a climate change solution which i am um, there's some really um, there's some amazing content out there but there's one particular podcast with a guy called Chris Magwood who set up a place called the Endeavour Centre in Canada and he builds with straw bales and has done for quite a long time and he has a vision of um, buildings as carbon sinks um, and a positive view of the future so using ag effectively agricultural waste capturing agricultural waste of any kind he talked in this podcast he talks about how to use um, the stalks of sunflowers and turning them into bales and putting them into buildings because that's carbon that is carbon in a plant that can be put into a building as a material. Um, so yes, there's some nice, um, there's some nice materials there that you can go and listen to. And that is me done. I don't know how long. Oh, it's twenty past nine. That's not hideous. That's not hideous. We're only seven minutes over. Um, so we've got time for a Q and A. If you would like to connect with me, if you're not already and you're on LinkedIn, there's my details. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Kate. That was awesome. Um, I'm sure there'll be um, lots of questions. Nicola, could uh, you stop me sharing? Because I couldn't do that earlier. Ooh. A few options. Yes, here we go. 
and I'm going to just unplug my other screen. So if I disappear again, I'll run and get my iPad. <laughs> I think. Um, <laughs> No, she's frozen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope okay. I haven't terrified everybody. I hope that was interesting. Um, obviously, it's quite high level. Um, of the Wellington Climate Action Group. Um, so that's my myself and Kate are, are sort of co-coordinating this group. And so we've come up with a, a basic action plan over the sort of the course of this year to look at some of the main things that we can do to help mitigate um, climate change in relation to, to the built environment and, and energy as well. So it's going to talk about this in more detail. She's going to put into the context, you know, what the what the sort of carbon footprint from homes on average in Watlington is. But just as a, a very top line sort of statistic, housing represents 37% of the total carbon footprint of Watlington. So it's a very big contributor to, to carbon um, and carbon related gases, greenhouse gases. And that average is 4.7 tonnes per household per year. So if you think about that per household, that's quite a lot of physical weight of carbon that each house is, is actually producing. These statistics come from um, something called the impact uh, tool or the impact calculator, which is a new tool which kind of um, brings together a lot of data on, on housing and consumption and, and averages out for each kind of parish, um, each city, town, whatever, uh, what the average output is. And it's really interesting tool to look at actually and i recommend taking a look if you haven't seen it so housing is actually the biggest contributor to, to um carbon emissions now what we want to do moving forward is to sort of understand this baseline that we have from the impact tool but but we need to we need to get more details we need to be more granular in the type of information that we're collecting so one of the first things we're going to do is launch a household survey and um, this would be across the parish from every single house and we hope to gain a lot more information on the types of energy that are being used by different households, the energy suppliers, the status of home insulation, household energy demands, um, and then other impacting factors that, that result in, in sort of, you know, greater carbon emissions. So our starting point is to get the information and, and raise awareness and, and sort of analyze the data that we collect from this household survey. So this is something we'll be rolling out as soon as we can, um, probably this month or maybe early next month. And that'll give us the baseline that we want to sort of develop our actions built upon or, or build upon for our actions. The next thing is the Knowledge Hub. And um, this is a sort of key resource depository, basically, um, or repository, where you can access information that is related to the homes and energy environment. Um, the idea here is to make sure that everybody has access to information, the access to the latest information, grants, research, all these kinds of things that are that's out there that exist, but not many people know about. Um, when I joined this group, I, I didn't have a lot of information about what was actually available for housing in terms of the grants and support that you can get. So we want to try and bring all this information together in one place where everybody can access that information. This will also be sort of providing tips on how to change your energy supplier, what the sort of recommended suppliers are, um, what grants and funding opportunities there are with community action groups or with um, government schemes that exist at the time. Um, as I said, sort of latest information on statistics and research and this kind of stuff, as well as some recommendations and quick fixes that people people can do within their own households. Sort of very simple, straightforward stuff. Just in brief, our themes and events for the year will be as follows. You can see in May, so we obviously have this, this event today, which will be Buildings versus Climate, which Kate will be talking about in a moment, um, and launching the Household Energy Survey as well. We will then launch the, the Knowledge Hub once, we, once we've covered, en covered enough information and resources to put on there. Um, so we'll have this nice fancy web page, hopefully, with all this information. July, as it starts to get warm, we'll look at water conservation and hopefully get a talker to, to come and give a brief sort of talk on water, water use. August will be about heating and overheating. Um, uh, Kate had this wonderful idea for a sort of icebox challenge where you build an insulated thing to try and keep the ice cool. And it's, it's all about insulation. It's very interactive kind of group outdoor activity, ideally. In September, we'll look at retrofitting um, and we'll start engaging with some of the specialists and, and sort of local groups that, that look at this kind of um, stuff and, and, and how they can come into the communities and support retrofitting activities. October, we'll look at heating. Um, obviously, this is when things start to get cold, so we'll look at some of the heating issues, how to change energy suppliers, 
and hopefully we'll get a talk by Cozy Homes, which is a, a local initiative, which is, which is really, really good. November is obviously the COP26, the, the sort of Climate Action Summit. So we're doing lots of community engagement in this time and, and looking at the built environment specifically and how that's represented within the COP, COP26 itself. And in December, we'll look specifically at insulation and, and draft proofing um, to get everyone nice and cozy for Christmas. During, during this time, obviously, these are the specific events that we'll be doing, but there will be a lot of ongoing efforts which will just be running throughout the time, throughout the time that, that we're sort of <laughs> being kept busy by all these other events. Um, but one of the main things that we'll be doing is look at looking at transitions and, and especially within the parish, you know, we really want to get as many people onto renewable energy sources as possible. This is a very, very simple, quick and easy fix that, that any household can really do, um, especially since prices are now very, very competitive, in some cases cheaper. Um, so, so this is certainly a sort of a big campaign that we want to continue to just be ongoing throughout the year. We also want to try and encourage the, the move from the use of oil and gas to purely electric, if possible. Um, there is still a surprising number of houses running off oil uh, for their heating and whatnot, which is, you know, quite surprising in, in this day and age. But, you know, it's, it's not, not anyone's fault, but it's just the way the infrastructure is, especially in a lot of these old buildings that we have around here. Um, so we'll be looking at ways to support this kind of transition. Community energy initiatives. This is a very long scale plan. This is something we would love to do um, in, in the sort of upcoming year or two, but this takes a lot of work. And there are a lot of you know, great community initiatives that exist um, from community energy generation itself um, to things like solar schools and solar streets, which we have colleagues, you know, friends on, on the call today um, who have actually engaged in this initiative already. Um, and then looking at EV charging as well. Obviously there's crossover there with the different transport groups, but. Um, these kinds of things all relate to energy and, and the carbon footprint. So these are kind of supporting initiatives that will be ongoing as well. Finally, our advocacy and awareness is, is a big part of, of what we'll be doing since we're focusing you know, quite heavily on the, the built environment. There are obviously developments taking place in Watlington. We want to make sure we're able to advocate for, for the proper standards um, to take place in these building developments. Should any further developments take place down the line, we'd love to have enough engagement with local authorities to make sure that standards are, are sort of high enough and, and met by the developers themselves. Um, on this, we want to make sure there's enough engagement with the local authorities and that people have access to information of what is happening in terms of the developments. Um, and additionally on this, just a continuous push for, for carbon reduction wherever possible um, and improved energy supply. So these are the main sort of ongoing efforts and, and the themes and the, the sort of calendar of, of events. Um, and I'm going to wrap up because hopefully Kate is back in business now. We'll have um, questions and answers at, at, at the end of the session. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Yay, we can all go to bed early. <laughs> I, did, I saw um, that um, Sophie put one in the chat. Okay, let's have a look. Um, which... Sophie, are you there? Muted. Yes, that's it. <laughs> I had to unmute myself first. Um, yes, um, so with many households um, getting more and more ready to switch to electricity only, um, or using more electricity uh, than in the past, um, for instance, for heating, um, I'm just wondering how the grid is going to cope with that. And you touched on this at some point. Um, I'm presuming that uh, the government is working with energy suppliers to this. Yeah, so there's, um, there's, a, there's a lot of work obviously going on in this area. It's called peak demand. Um, and we have a certain number of terawatt hours. Um, well, there's a certain number of terawatts that the UK can produce at any given point. Um, and consumption, if everybody suddenly switched to air source heat pumps, it, it wouldn't be able to be met. So there are, first of all, we've got to reduce the demand. I mean, as I said in that, on that triangle diagram, you can't have homes using 12,000 kilowatt hours a year. You need to get, and I did have a chart, but I hid it. Um, in fact, it was one of the ones I skipped over. Homes have got to be reduced. So everybody lives in an EPC C house instead of most people living in a D or worse. And mm -hmm. um, so that the energy consumption for heating, which is the predominant use is lower. Um, and that's the starting point and then start to electrify. And then as I shared on the 
um, Facebook group earlier, start to think about community energy generation, solar yeah. panels on your roof. How can you actually create and sell electricity um, within your community? Um, yeah. So they're hopeful that thermal storage and electricity storage, so batteries, will help moderate those peak loads um, so that um, housing the demand because if you, you add on electric vehicles to this as well it creates another problem and um, we don't want to be using more electricity in the uk we want to be actually using less and so they having to plan for the future what that looks like in terms of localizing um, production but also radically reducing demand and demand has reduced so one of the pages although i don't think i read it out um said that um something like there's been something like a 35 percent reduction in average heating demand over the last 15 years yeah. um and partly that's to do with extra insulation and some of that is just because new homes have been built and they're more efficient anyway um but on average homes are more efficient now than they were in the past um, but that's got to really come down and new homes need to be built so they only use 2000 kilowatt hours of heat instead of 5,000 kilowatt hours of heat yeah, yeah. um so it's these things are all linked together and the national grid works with the government and all these strategic plans for are we going to build more nuclear um things like that so yes but we're well placed because we've got plenty of offshore wind in the uk <laughs> um so yes yes i think it's doable there are loads of scenarios that show that it's doable um with heat pumps um but we do need things like localization of production yeah. as well thank you Maureen. Yeah, oh, yes, I, that's fantastic presentations by everybody. I don't think I'll sleep tonight, not that I didn't know it, but just being reminded of it is absolutely terrifying. But uh, what we're trying to do in our house, we've done quite a lot of a lot of things, including uh, panels and all the um, energy efficiency or conservation. So we're trying to get rid of the gas. So we're just trying to experiment how to do this. So we've just got the gas, gas central heating and um and the gas cooker so we're going to get um, an electric cooker electric hob sorry we've got the electric cooker oven but the, the heater so what we thought was sort of compare the price of buying a few heaters um to sort of a you know getting a heat pump is just incredibly different so trying to research an electric heater which is the most efficient and make it, and that you're as comfortable as you can be bearing in mind our homes are mostly open plan it's very difficult but um you know I, I i couldn't really get very far couldn't get much advice and we did buy heat for 78 pound which can run at one kilowatt um i mean you've got to be fairly close to it to be warm <laughs> but i i just don't know if there is there any advice out there you know we we've got solar panels we've got a battery storage and we've got you know we with good energy so you know done as best as we can there but how to actually get rid of the gas um and i only heat where we are we don't want to heat the whole house with our gas central heating so we just haven't used it for quite a long time but you know how how to be comfortable in your own home now that's the issue I think you've got you've got a couple of things to consider. I mean, if you don't want to use gas, um, you do need to still think about how you're going to heat your whole home, because if you turn off the, the, the boiler and you don't have the boiler anymore, you're going to have to heat all the rooms because if you don't heat all the rooms. You will get rooms that are too cold and then you'll start getting damp um, and mold growth in those rooms where they get too cold and especially around the windows behind cupboards, things like that. So you do still need to make sure you're adequately heating your whole house. So have a look at your gas bill and see how much energy you're using. Um, and then because that basically represents the amount of heat energy that you need in your home in a year. Um, and you whilst you can keep yourself warm in one room by pointing a one kilowatt heater at your feet, a one kilowatt heater won't adequately heat that room at all, yeah. let alone put in, even putting one of those in each room won't adequately heat your house. So it's kind of, as I said uh, um, in the presentation, you've got to kind of start at the whole house level, which is how can you reduce the demand that the heat that the house has for heating. So where can you add insulation? Can you upgrade the windows? Can you just block up loads of holes and drafts and gaps that you've got? Can you draft proof your windows and your doors? If you can get the heating demand down, then you can start to think about how can we can we get rid of gas in this house? Because also, how are you heating your water? Are you heating your water on gas? Um, or have you got electric? You've got an emergency. Through the solar. We're doing it through the solar Okay, panels. you've got solar water. Okay, well, that's great. Um, but it, it, I mean, you might be using 
I mean, a typical house is using 10,000 kilowatt hours a year um, for heating or, or 10,000 kilowatt hours a year for gas. So say six and a half thousand kilowatt hours a year for heating. That's a lot of energy um, that you need. And you've got to think about how you're going to replace that. Now, maybe you don't want to be 22 degrees anymore. Maybe you could live with being 18. But well, we're, we're 16 currently. Yeah, OK, but you need to keep the fabric of the building safe as well. Yeah. So it isn't just about keeping yourselves comfortable. Um, it's about making sure that the fabric, that the walls aren't deteriorating because they're getting damp because they're 12 degrees now inside. Okay. So if you've got once you get to 12 degrees on the surface temperature, you'll get condensation. And then when you've got condensation, you'll get mold growth if you haven't got sufficient ventilation. So yeah. you just need to be cautious. I mean, you know, by all means, go around and turn all your, you know, if you've got thermostatic control valves, turn them down. You can think about smart control systems. You can think about direct electric. You can have infrared panels. There's lots of options. Um, you know, if you're determined to get rid of gas, there is advice out there. And there's a the Centre for Sustainable Energy, um, which I don't know if Tom mentioned because I can't remember what you said in your presentation. Um, but um, yeah, there's plenty of advice out there. And one of the things we're going to do is set up what we're calling our knowledge hub, which is not information that we're going to write ourselves, but it's links to information from people like the Central Alternative Technology, the Centre for Sustainable Energy, a really excellent resource I found yesterday, which I think is called One Home, but I can't quite remember, um, that has loads of really good advice and leaflets. And CSE is brilliant for this, the Centre for Sustainable Energy. They've got loads of leaflets that you can just download and read about that. I can give advice directly, um, and there will be other people like me who can give advice. You'll find that, well, there are plenty of people who know what I know, but would be specific to wanting to sell you a heat pump. So you just need to be aware that if you're going to talk to a heat pump supplier and ask them what you should do in your house, they're going to say, have a heat pump and they'll do some calculations for you and tell you how much that's going to be. And um, that might not be the best solution. Um, so, yeah, start with the CSE website, actually. I think that's yes. probably a good resource for you. Thank you. OK, um, brilliant. We've also had oh, lots of um, Thanks, Tom. comments um, from from Donna contributing um, various. I, I have to look over here because on my other screen, because the chat thing doesn't work on my laptop. Um, uh, but if you can see those, um, Maureen, I use electric oil radiators in the coldest part of the house to avoid the gas. So that seems like a a good compromise. Yeah, uh, but if you think about an electric oil radiator, how efficient is an electric radiator? So if you're if you're buying from a renewable energy supplier and your electricity is decarbonized, brilliant. But you're probably using because gas burns quite efficiently. Um, and electricity is obviously 100% efficient, um, but your heat in an oil radiator, that's not 100% efficient because you've got to heat up the oil and there's some going to be some, you know, stuff going on there chemically. Um, so, yeah, an oil radiator might not be the most efficient. You might be better off with a fan heater. Um, but, yeah, the amount of heat you'll get from a heater or a radiator isn't a small compact one, isn't the same as what you would get from a, a radiator that's sized to heat up a room. Um, so it just won't give you the same app. You might feel comfortable next to it, but it won't keep the building safe. Well, so lots of um, really good links in there um, yeah. from Donna and also from from Tom. Yeah, Donna says it's, they're expensive. They're ex they're expensive. What are expensive? I, don't, I haven't followed. What's expensive? Donna. Oh, batteries. Oh, batteries. Yeah. The, as far as the oil radiators that run on electricity that I have, it allows me to keep my thermostat at 19. If I didn't have that sitting in the coldest side of the house, I'd have to put the thermostat up to sort of 21 or something. Mm -hmm. And I, I have it set on a timer, so it comes on first thing in the morning for, I don't know, half an hour, an hour. And then it comes on in the evening, just to take the edge off. Mm -hmm. So, but they're, they're expensive as far as running them on electricity. I have one yeah. of those smart meters and I can, it goes orange when I put them on. Well, it's like when you boil your kettle, your kettle yeah. might use two kilowatts or three kilowatts for one and a half minutes. That's a lot of electricity. If you put on an electric heater all day, it's going to use dozens of kilowatt hours of electricity, which will yeah. cost you a lot more than putting on a gas boiler. And, and yes, I mean, gas, you can't decarbonize gas um, as it stands. 
Um, but it is cheaper and it is more efficient um, because your system has been sized to heat up your house effectively. That's one of the issues that I'm hearing from the industry, from installers, is when householders replace gas boilers and gas um, central heating systems with air source heat pumps, you have to resize the whole system because it runs at a lower temperature. So now you've got to have new radiators in your whole house. You've got to have control valves everywhere. You've got to have new plants put in your garage or somewhere new. It's got to sit outside. You've got to, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's lots of things going on and it needs to be correctly sized or you're going to just have to turn it up too far, which now means it's not running at 300 percent efficiency. It's running at 100 percent efficiency. And suddenly you're spending four times more on your heating because electricity is four times more expensive than gas. Yeah. So you have to be really careful. And this can happen with air source heat pumps is they tend to get oversized because someone will come to your house and say, you've got a 25 kilowatt or a 30 kilowatt gas boiler here, have a heat pump that's the same size. You don't need that because your gas boiler rarely is ever outputting that much heat into your house. But a heat pump that's working at too low an output is not efficient. And so it's costing you too much money to heat your house when it's mild and you put it on and you only want it to be 19 degrees. So it's just that the industry hasn't quite adapted to how to use heat pumps efficiently in homes, in existing homes, mm -hmm. um, because you need air tightness, you need proper sized radiators, all of these things. It's really complicated. It isn't just about switching one for the other. Um, I'm not entirely convinced. This isn't services is not my area of expertise, but I do read plenty of, about mm -hmm. it and it doesn't look straightforward. So we have our, our gas supplier um, is from Bulb um, and all and that says it's not um, it's not it's offset it's partly offset and it's partly um, green, gas. Uh, green gas yeah that's so green gas is um, is carbon neutral um, but there's not that much of it I guess but it's, it's exactly the same as renewable electricity just because you purchase a renewable tariff from your electricity supply doesn't mean that the electricity that you're getting down the wire into your house is renewable you're obviously getting the electricity from Deepcott power station um, i guess i guess it's the same I guess, with gas yeah but i guess um to what extent could gas be decarbonized by moving to green gas well it can't really because it's it's a little bit of a misnomer because you know you're it's still emitting even if it's been somehow magically offset um i mean burning gas does emit emissions um it's just chemistry um so yeah we we do the same we've got a green gas tariff we pay the supplier to offset the emissions um yeah yeah but this says on their website it's not just uh, offsetting it a chunk come of our gas mix comes from renewable sources cool so I don't, good. <laughs> yeah i don't know more than that no, I don't know more than that either. When, when you buy from companies like that, aren't you just allowing them to invest in greener options? Yeah, and you are. Good. And that's and then that's why the, the example I gave of good energy, which was just a nice infographic, which is why I chose them, is they are only investing in renewable energy supply. Yeah. So, you know, they're investing in wind power, hydropower, you know, whatever. Um, they're not building gas fired power stations. Um, they're only building offshore wind farms the problem, um, of course with all that wind power is you've got to make the the blades and things the well the embodied carbon yeah and there's a really yeah. interesting page in my deck that's hidden that shows the energy intensity of the infrastructure yeah um, for these things it's crazy um, and it's, it's 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 ridiculous i mean it was an analysis that bill gates did in his book and it's quite shocking yeah. um uh, the amount of space that's needed for solar power to create the same amount of energy as what you get from a coal-fired power station the embodied energy is ridiculous. Um, we've got a question from Charlotte about electric underfloor heating. That's not a question. That just says electric underfloor heating, question mark. With a question mark. Um, <laughs> um, Charlotte, what's your question? <laughs> is she there? Maybe it's um, it. Electric underfloor it was, heating. It was just in, uh, in regards to the... the the discussion about um electric heaters and i yeah i was just wanted to know how electric underfloor if you have the you know if you get going only have electric it's electric underfloor heating something to look at or not so i would strongly advise you if you're putting in any underfloor heating to make sure that your floor is properly insulated because if it's not you are heating up oxfordshire 
And when I moved to my house um, 15 years ago, we had electric underfloor heating in our kitchen and it was lovely. We could walk around barefoot in the winter and it was fabulous. And our electricity bills were astronomical. And when we had the extent and we switched it off, we never used it again. We just, you know, the, the kitchen was never cold because there was always cooking going on when we were in there. So we didn't really need it. Um, and we switched it off and we said we're not using that anymore because it's so expensive and when we built the extension and we took that floor up it's because the floor wasn't insulated so the electric underfloor heating was heating up the ground predominantly um which is absurd so if you're going to use underfloor heating insulate the floor first electric underfloor heating is really no different from a wet system um it's just another way of having a heat emitter um it's probably going to cost you a bit more to run because it's electricity instead of gas and it's more expensive per unit so if you, you're heating up the mass of the floor so you can afford we've got it on a quite a big floor area in our new kitchen it's a wet system it's properly insulated um and we only have it on for about three hours a day in the morning and it heats up the mass of the floor where it's concrete um and and the, the room is you know nice you know we still wear slippers you wouldn't walk around barefoot um but the room is nice because then you've got a massive radiative heat source and which is just at quite a low level so it, it does work quite well but make sure it's insulated please <laughs> okay fantastic um i think that's um probably all the questions and it's uh 20 to 10 so uh, or do you have one more sophie there are, yeah. Jeanette asked a question as well. Um, um, yes, um, I'm very aware that we need to do more on our house with regards to installation and uh, ventilation. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm just a bit concerned about finding um, good, in, uh, good people to do installation and to advise on installation on the wet type, where to do it, that kind of thing. Um, and whether they are certificated or whether there's some form of reassurance that we can get from providers, from you know, installers. But also, um, given that we need to look at, ventil at ventilation at the same time, um, is it something that the trade and people who work in that trade do in conjunction, i.e. doing uh, what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's, um, if you go to a company that provides insulation in the same way that if you go to a double glazing provider, they will have a certification scheme that means that you don't have to go through a building regulation submission. Um, so if you were like my house, we're doing the roof, we're doing the render and we're doing the window. So we have to do a building regulation submission because we're above the um the hurdle for when we have to submit something to the council ourselves um which is annoying because now i've got to do some drawings um but um if you go to a, a reputable supplier they will have a certification scheme that they participate in and they will be able to certify the insulation in installation or the window installation or whatever as separate individual project projects mm -hmm. what you will probably find is that and i can't speak for everybody because some companies will do everything but a company that provides insulation probably doesn't also provide ventilation systems. So they'll just say, oh, well, go to another company over there and find yourself a ventilation system. Why don't you? So and it's which is why they're changing the rules about how retrofit should be managed. So the re I haven't gone into that in any detail. In July this year, there is new regulation coming into force, which says that if you're going to carry out major renovation work on your house, you have to have what's called a whole house plan um, created. And that says these are the steps that you have to take in this order and this is how they have to be coordinated to avoid creating problems down the line so don't start with doing this instead do this first then do this if you do this make sure you do this and you'll have a whole plan and the order of the works that have to happen and then you can go to the individual suppliers and say well you need to do this but you need to be aware that i've got to have a ventilation unit put into my bathroom to make sure that i don't get condensation for mm. example um, so yes, I, I don't think it's well coordinated at the moment, especially if you went to a general builder, yeah. a general builder will probably just say, well, yes, of course you need an extractor fan in that bathroom and they'll just put something simple on the wall. Um, yeah. but they won't necessarily, in fact, they almost certainly won't do any kind of calculation looking at the performance of the whole building, which is what will soon be required. Um, okay. it's something I could potentially help you with later in the year, Sophie. Mm. Did Thank anyone you. did anyone have any questions on the projects that we're going to be running? It, that feels like a very, <laughs> very long time ago, didn't it? Uh, Tom took us through all of that. Um, okay. Oh yes, Maureen. 
And mute, Maureen. Maureen, you're on mute. I was trying to work, I'm working with the parish council to try and get some sort of information hub going. And I don't feel like, you know, somebody's doing the work, can we share it? Yeah. I don't know about that, Maureen, because the Climate Advisory Board is meant to be working with the parish council. I think council. Maureen's talking about a different parish council. Oh, I'm just oh. talking about in China, sorry. In, in China, oh, sorry. I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm working with the, the, on the climate emergency um, policy we've got. And, you know, one of the things is information for, um, for the residents here. So I've been tasked to try and get some sort of information hub going, but to say I could spend hours and hours and hours researching it, but if you're already doing it, can I share it? Can you well, share it with me? Um, we're only copying creating links plagiarizing other people's sources so um have a look at um i'll copy that again into the chat at the bottom again this yes. one home um link that i found yesterday that tom already shared um is incredibly helpful um yeah. someone has gone and set that up for their community and it's a it's a national resource um so go and have a look at that so i collected i connected with the ceo of that organization yesterday and she's a very nice lady um so hopefully um I think we'll just we'll just provide links to that stuff. We're not going to create our own content immediately. Um, so yeah, by all means, we can share what we know. Um, okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Jeanette had a question. Sorry, Jeanette did have a question. Let's just go back. Jeanette says, it sounds like it's better to keep my electric storage heaters than move to an aerosol heat pump. Um, the answer to that would be, Yes, probably, provided your electric storage heaters are working efficiently and you're using um, a cheap overnight electricity tariff um, to heat them up. Um, if you're going to have an aerosol seat pump, I'll say it again, start off by reducing the demand for your house by creating insulation and um, air tightness and making sure you've got adequate ventilation first um, before looking at an aerosol seat pump. Everyone has heard about aerosol seat pumps and thinks they're a great idea and it's everything that people want to know about but it's kind of start with the energy demand then do the heat pump then put the solar panels on your roof um, and if you don't need a heat pump because well yours your house is different but my house has got a gas boiler so i'll try to make sure when i do the upgrades to my fabric my building fabric that we're not excluding the ability to have a heat pump in the future but there's no way i'm going to put a heat pump in now because they're ten thousand pounds and i've got a six-year-old gas boiler why on earth would i do that Plus, I'd have to rip everything out inside to have different size heaters. So, Jeanette, I think you're probably better off as you are as long as they're working well. Um, and if they're not, and you do need to have a new heat source, then don't start there. Start with energy um, demand reduction first. OK, thanks. Um, oh, well done, Tom. You've just answered Andrea's question. <laughs> that was easy. OK, well, Thank you very much. Oh, the other ones on sorry, the other ones on the presentation that, that Kate had, but yeah. Oh yeah, let me just get that for Andrea so that um oh so that it's there. Uh, Thank you. Uh, but feel free to wrap up, Nicola. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, every everyone for coming. Thank you so much to uh, Kate and Tom for their presentations. Um, we'll be sending out a link um afterwards. Um. Uh, with the with the presentation if you want to hear all that again because there was so much information um but i think uh, i think i'll be listening to it twice um and we'll also be sending a, a questionnaire to get your thoughts um on on tonight's event and on the on the program of homes and energy projects in in general um so yeah look out for that in your inboxes um and um we'll see you hopefully with we'll, we'll send you uh, an email if you're not on our mailing list already then uh please um, let me know if you'd like to be added to it so you can find out about our, our next events whenever, whenever we next have them. And that's it. <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, oh, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Kate. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. I'll wait, Nicola, in case you want yeah. to. Yeah, I do. Thanks. Oh, Satnam is still there. Satnam. Well, he's behind the logo, isn't he? Yes. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> You're going to come back online, I think, Satnam, aren't you? Yeah, I'm here. And <laughs> Oliver is me. My other right. Oh, yeah. so you're to, two. You're two. Don't forget to press the stop record button. Yeah. Um, not sure if Jenny is still here or not. So, Nicola, did you stop?
did you stop recording? I'm going to stop recording. Yeah. I think Jenny um, went somewhere a while ago. Andrea, are you still there? Yep, I'm still here. Okay. And I stop recording. Stop. Do I and want to stop take cloud a while, recording? Just let it sit there and whatever it's doing. So do you want to stop cloud recording? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, God.